and today's lecture is on chapter nine. So this is going to be about institutional pharmacy practice. What, Miss Miss Writing? <laughs> yes. I just got another phone call. I think that was Milton who tried to join because he was just in the other phone call. Hmm. So, okay. Um, no worries. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. So we'll start with um, an introduction. So the picture that I have here is a picture that I found online, which really looks like a hospital setting. Uh, the actual, can you guys see my mouse when I move it? Yes. Okay, this section here is, uh, I wanna say, uh, uh, the pneumatic tube. So this is where people uh, in the pharmacy can put in the prescriptions and if they need to immediately deliver it to a nursing's floor, then they could put it in the pneumatic tube. If you've ever been to the bank through the drive through in that nice little tube that goes up and then it sends the check or the money to the teller, they have one of those in the hospitals. And so that could be a very uh, fast way of how a nursing floor could receive medicine for a patient, especially if it's something that they need stat, which you'll learn stat means immediately uh, as one of the uh, abbreviations that you'll continue to learn. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the objectives. So in this chapter, you will be learning about the hospital environment. At the end of this chapter, you should be able to define the most common tasks performed by hospital pharmacy technicians, be able to identify different types of pharmacy settings in the hospital. You should also be able to discuss different hospital pharmacy standards and procedures, as well as identify the difference between formulary and non-formulary medication list. Uh, formulary is something that's approved and non-formulary is something that's not approved. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Also, you should be able to explain the importance of good relationship between the pharmacy and the nursing staff and the hospital saying everyone works together. So it's not just because you are in a closed uh, pharmacy inside of the hospital that you only interact with pharmacy personnel. You'll also be interacting with the nursing staff, uh, who knows, doctors. Uh, and then based on your role in the hospital setting, there is even an opportunity for you to also have a better relationship with patients. Uh, and so we'll get into a little bit of that as we continue. Some more uh, things that you'll be learning this chapter is you should be able to identify different regulatory agencies that govern the operation of hospitals, including pharmacies in the hospital. You learned a little bit about that when you looked up medical agencies yesterday, during less, yesterday's lab, learning about uh, the Joint Commission and the Board of Pharmacy, giving those for some examples. You should also be able to describe the following related to hospital orders, which is listing uh, various ways orders are processed by the pharmacy, identifying the difference between STAT, ASAP, and standing orders. I just gave an example of what a STAT order is, uh, STAT meaning immediately. Uh, you should also be able to describe POE, CPOE, BPOE, and the CADM. All of those are acronyms, and you'll be learning what those acronyms stand for. So a little bit about an introduction with hospital pharmacies. Those are the most common institutional settings, and it's the most challenging area to work, primarily because everything um, is usually uh, needed as like like that very quickly and so for pharmacy technicians there are fewer job openings uh, because the staffing in the pharmacy in the hospital setting uh, they usually have different hours and uh, the work is more clinical so it's 
more people who are technicians, they have to be highly skilled um, and they have to be trained in those environments. So there are there is even certification for a person who wants to work in a a hospital setting as far as a compounding sterile technician and I'll go into a little bit more information about that as we continue in this chapter. There are a lot of uh, different tasks and it can be complicated and there's a lot of multitasking that has to happen in a pharmacy setting. So some of the tasks that a pharmacy technician would be doing in a hospital setting is preparing an IV, uh, the IV medications, IV standing for intravenous, uh, they'll also be loading the patient medications in the carts, and then they're also responsible for entering the uh, data in the pharmacy computer system. So, for example, in a community pharmacy setting where they would, you know, have a certain uh, a lot of time, a certain amount of time to complete a medication order. Uh, if you've ever been to a community pharmacy, sometimes they'll say, you know, the wait time will be maybe an hour or maybe two hours, and then, you know, people can kind of wait for their medicine. In a hospital setting, the wait time cannot be that long. It literally has to be prepared uh, within, the ma within a matter of minutes, and if you've ever been to a hospital, you know that the hospital is filled with a lot of different patients, so imagine 75 people needing their drugs like this same minute and it's only five people in the hospital uh in the pharmacy so just using that as an example so there are fewer hospitals uh than community pharmacies you can probably go down the street and you can count probably 10 depending on what street you're on you can probably count maybe like 10 community pharmacies whereas hospitals again fewer uh, so we live in the state of Florida, so you can probably name about five hospitals right now versus you could probably name maybe 50 or 100 um, well, if you know independent pharmacies in regards to uh, the differences between community pharmacy and then institutional. Now, uh, despite the best efforts of managed care, hospital utilization is rising as the population ages. So there are different reasons why people may have to go to the hospital. They may be having different circumstances. Uh, you know, maybe somebody has high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, cholesterol. Uh, some people may have emergencies. What if someone just fell off the bike and, you know, got injured and they have to go to the hospital based on the reason why they're at the hospital, they're going to need medication and it's the pharmacy uh, responsibility to um, make the IV bags that you see uh, and also dispense uh, the medicine for all of the patients that's in the hospital. So this is just a mini introduction when it comes to the hospital setting. So now that I've given you an introduction, we'll next learn about the different types of hospitals. So the size of the hospital is different because it depends on the number of patient beds available. So a small hospital would have about 50 beds or less, and then a large hospital is known to have anywhere between 500 to 250 beds or perhaps even more. Some other differences uh, regarding the different types of hospitals is some of them have um, capabilities in diagnosing, uh, some hospitals have different surgeries available, and then some of them also offer different outpatient services. And an outpatient service is where the person doesn't have to be admitted to the hospital. Now, you can refer to uh, table 9.1 in your book to see a list of the various types and sizes of hospitals. Those could be found in your Kindles. Uh, now, with small hospitals, those usually do not have specialized diagnosis or even have major surgery capabilities. So their patients might have to be transferred or referred to a larger hospital for such services. If you've ever had a loved one go to a smaller hospital and based on their diagnosis, uh, they may have to go to another hospital. So maybe behind the scenes, you didn't understand that, but now learning this information, you kind of understand why someone might be transferred to another hospital. So now that we talked about the different types of hospitals, let's next talk about the hospital pharmacy setting. Now, the differences between a hospital pharmacy setting and a community pharmacy setting, one of them is the layout of the pharmacy and how it is. Uh, you have older hospitals, which may have a central inpatient pharmacy. That's where they will fill 
the all of the medications for those patients that's inside of the pharmacy. Now, some larger or newer hospitals, those have central and satellite pharmacies. Central would still be where they would be uh, completing, preparing prescriptions for the patients that's in the hospital, but a satellite pharmacy, they fill mostly uh, the daily medications for the patients on their floors. So central might be, okay, this person needs this medicine right here, right now, whereas a satellite pharmacy, there are some patients that's been admitted to the hospital for say 30 days. So that person is already on a medication regimen. So maybe the satellite pharmacy will fill the medications for that patient. Just use that as an example. Uh, other differences when it comes to the hospital pharmacy setting is some hospitals are known as teaching hospitals. Those teaching hospitals might have specialties in pediatrics, burn units, um, ICUs, better known as uh, intensive care units, and then some might also have cancer units. Uh, for satellite pharmacies, uh, those have specialty pharmacies that supply a clinic, and then you also have a discharge pharmacy. And the discharge pharmacy are for patients who have now been released from the hospital, but instead of them having to go out to a community setting to fill their prescriptions when they get ready to want to leave the hospital, they can go to a discharge pharmacy. Some hospitals have both a central inpatient pharmacy and then some have a discharge pharmacy where before the person gets ready to leave, they can get their prescriptions filled. And that particularly works like a community pharmacy setting, except for it's just for those patients who are just now getting ready to leave the hospital. So now that I've given you some examples of what a hospital pharmacy setting is, let's next learn the differences between formulary and non-formulary medications. So with the formulary medication, those particular medications are approved for use by a particular healthcare entity. For example, if you were to go to a hospital and, well, let me not say you, let me say a, a, a person. If a person were to go to a hospital, that particular hospital has a formulary list of medications that's approved and the doctors or prescribers of that particular healthcare entity known as the hospital uh, would have a list to choose from of what medications they could prescribe. A non-formulary list are a non-formulary list are is a list of meds that are not approved. So formulary means it's approved, non-formulary means it's not approved. And the same thing works when it comes to insurance companies. Insurance companies, uh, insurance companies have a list of medicines that they approve for the entire year. And based on those medicines, that's what they'll cover and the other ones they might not cover or they might cover but with a prior authorization and we'll get into that a little bit later. Now how are formularies developed? They're developed by a group of specialty physicians and pharmacists in the hospital. That could be known as the P&T committee which is known as the, pharma the pharmaceutical uh, therapy committee. Uh, now, drugs are evaluated based on the cost, effectiveness, and safety, and then also patient demographics. So, this group of uh, practitioners, like I like to call them, physicians and pharmacists, they develop what for, what's going to be on that formulary. And so, whatever patient comes to their hospital, the doctors or the prescribers that's already assigned have a list of medicines that they can approve, or should I say, write from. In those, and that's the differences between a formulary and a non formulary. Now, if the recommended criteria is not met, then the drug is considered non formulary and is not approved on the approved list. So there might be a difference in cost when it comes to what's approved and what's not approved. So now that we've gone over some examples of formulary and non formulary medications, we're next going to learn about the relationship between pharmacy and the nursing staff.
Now, the nurses are the pharmacy's primary customers because they should receive, so they should receive the highest level of support. The nurses are dealing one-on-one -on -one with patients. And so when they need something, whether it's an IV bag, whether it's the IV tubing, whatever it is, they need support from the pharmacy department. And as pharmacy technicians, we definitely should always be uh, in a supportive role. So nurses depend on the pharmacy for all of the medication. And when I say all, I mean all. Whether it's a Tylenol, sometimes patients come to the hospital with a headache or maybe with a tummy ache. And based on the diagnosis, maybe the nurse just says, you know what, you just need an ibuprofen and, you know, we're going to sit you here with the IV bag and, you know, see what that does. The IV bag comes from the pharmacy department in the hospital setting. The Tylenol or the ibuprofen or any other medicine that is offered on the nursing floor comes from the pharmacy department. So it all works together. Now, nurses often make inquiries to the pharmacy, including uh, patient medication status and drug interaction. Perhaps the patient is already taking a medication and uh, maybe the prescriber has now prescribed something new. And so they may want to call to make sure nothing's going to interact. Uh, they can call the pharmacy to talk about dosing ranges and pharmacy calculations. Um, and they also have the most common question, which is, hey, where are the medications that are ordered? Because they needed it like yesterday. So these are things that you can communicate with the nursing staff, but you want to make sure that you're always using professional development when doing so. Now, the collaboration between both the pharmacy and the nursing staff is going to help be is going to be helpful with preventing medication errors. Now, medicate now a medication error is something that is preventable. Medication errors can be preventable. And an, an example of a medication error could be a person uh, typing a prescription for the wrong patient. Or maybe there is a drug that sounds exactly the same of what the prescriber prescribed, but maybe the wrong drug was selected. Maybe uh, the wrong time. Uh, maybe the drug was given at the wrong time. These are examples of medication errors. So nurses generally account for more than 80% of the calls or electronic contacts with the inpatient pharmacy. And any pharmacy technician when asked where are the medications that are ordered can answer simply by accessing the computer system and then seeing where the medication is uh, based on the process. So when you get familiar with a data entry system, and we do have one available in our school, and that's actually the book that you were provided. Let me give the example. The Pharmacy Software Management Book. This is the book that we use uh, as a simulated database. So uh, there are uh, download instructions in the first page. You'll follow those instructions and then you can download this book to your computer and then you can begin practicing the software. But wherever the prescription is in the queue, you would check it. So same thing if you were in real life and you were working at a hospital setting, you would check to see where the medication is and then maybe it's almost about to be checked by the pharmacist. And so then you can say it's being checked right now by the pharmacist. We'll get that to you within the next five minutes. So whenever someone is calling you, uh, you definitely want to be able to make sure that you have an answer for them. And if you don't have an answer, find the answer and find out uh, what information you can be sharing with them. So now that I've gone over a little bit of information in regards to the pharmacy and the nursing staff relationship, we're next going to talk about the regulatory agencies. Now, all hospitals must meet federal and state guidelines and the Department of Public Health they are the ones who set the standards of safe operation. Now, the Board of Pharmacies, the State Board of Pharmacies, that's abbreviated as BOP, they are the ones who inspect the facilities and also ensure that the personnel are working within their guidelines. So there is a duty and a responsibility of what a pharmacy technician can do, and then there is a duty and a responsibility of what a pharmacist can do. Now, some of those roles do enter are the same in regards to you know how to fill a prescription, uh, typing information in for a patient. Uh, but then there are also roles that a pharmacy technician cannot take. Uh, we in the state of Florida, we are not allowed to counsel as a pharmacy technician. So that's one of the things that we would make sure that that is directed to the pharmacist. 
So if a nursing, if a nurse, if one of the nursing staff was to call and ask a question about, hey, does this interact with another drug? You know, we can't answer that. That's a counseling question. So that would be directed to the pharmacist. Um, also doing a final check. A uh, final check is where the medication has been filled and it's about to go out to the patient, but there is a final check that has to happen. It is the pharmacist who does that not a pharmacy technician. So these are some of the differences as far as the roles. But the State Board of Pharmacy, they also uh, ensure that people are working within their guidelines and not outside of the scope of their practice. So the Board of Pharmacy may even impose fines on or even close pharmacies that are not in compliance with current laws. So that's why there is continuing education for pharmacists and there is even continuing education for pharmacy technicians so that everyone would know their role and know what to do. So in addition to learning about regulatory agencies, uh, there are other agencies that govern the entire operation of things. Uh, some examples would be the TJC, that stands for the Joint Commission. They set the standard on accreditation and inspection. You have CMS, which stands for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, they provide the funding for uh, the people who um, participate in Medicare or Medicaid services. You have uh, HHS, which is the Department of Health and Human Services. Other governs of other agencies are uh, DPH, which is, which is the Department of Health, and then I also lastly just mentioned uh, BOP, which stands for uh, this whatever state board of pharmacy. So we're in Florida, so our BOP is called the Florida Board of Pharmacy. And so some of the differences between the two, uh, the Joint Commission, they have inspections performed every three years. And hospitals prepare for these inspections and they work continually to ensure that they meet the standards for accreditation. Uh, so hospitals are usually inspected by TJC. Also, I've seen nursing homes be inspected by TJC, just to give uh, an example. Now, CMS inspects the facilities and they must give approval for hospitals to provide care and receive reimbursement for those patients that's covered by CMS. So those uh, people who are who have Medicaid or Medicare services, their care is funded by that particular uh, agency. So hospitals, even pharmacies that's receiving funding from CMS has to make sure that, you know, they are following guidelines and making sure that they're doing the right thing or else the funding will stop. And if the funding stops, then that means that person can't go to that pharmacy or to the hospital if they no longer accept uh, Medicare or Medicaid services. Uh, HHS, um, Home and Health Services, they're, uh, they are the primary agency that protects the health of the American people and also provides essential human services. So these are just some of the examples of the regulatory agencies. Uh, this was also one of the labs that was given uh, yesterday uh, for you to get more familiar with the different uh, agencies. So now that I've talked about the regulatory agencies, let's next learn about the flow of orders. How is the workflow in a hospital setting? So primarily what happens is the prescriber visits the patient in the hospital and then based on diagnosis, the prescriber will write a, pres a medication order, which is equivalent to a prescription. The medication order is then written on the prescriber's order sheet and then it's placed in the patient's record, better known as a chart. When we talk about chart, we're referring to a hospital setting. Now, the unit clerk checks the chart and then sends the new order to the appropriate department. Now, orders can include dietary restrictions. Maybe the person's supposed to have water after a certain time, or maybe there is a test that, need, that needs to be ran. Uh, like, I'm not sure if anyone has ever been in the hospital and uh, if you've ever heard the, the prescriber say, okay, this person needs the blood work done. So the laboratory test that might be on the medication order might be CBC, which is abbreviated for complete blood count, just using that as an example. On that medication order, they can also write prescriptions, medications, excuse me, and all of these, which a nurse per periodically sends to the appropriate area to be filled. So no one's going to send the pharmacy lab, uh, the lab test. Hey, run these labs. That's not our department. 
um, and it's not going to really benefit the pharmacy to know the dietary, if there are dietary uh, restrictions, okay, this person shouldn't have water. We're not providing water to the patient. We provide the medicine. So just using that as an example, when it comes to the proper department, which is filling whatever the order is from the prescriber. So continuing understanding about the flow of orders, there is an importance understanding what is considered patient information. So in the hospital setting, in the patient's profile, there's going to be the patient's full name, their date of birth, also their medical record. It's going to have their room number, their diagnosis, what's their weight, and it's also going to have their drug allergies. Now that's very important to pay attention to because if their allergies are not on file and something is given to them, they might have an interaction. So we always want to make sure that the drug allergies are on file if they're allergic to anything. Now the medical record number is the primary way patients are identified. So sometimes if someone's calling, they won't say the patient's name because that's HIPAA. H-I-P-A-A, that's the abbreviation. And so they might actually uh, just reference the medical record number, which you would have to be in the person's system and have access to a system to access any of that information based on the number. So uh, why are, you might wonder why are room numbers uh, not a reliable way to identify a patient? Well, a patient might move through three or four units in a single day. So I use myself as an example. Uh, when I was uh, pregnant and uh, went through labor and delivery, I went on three floors. I was on three different floors. I was on the first floor when I got entered into the hospital and they were just checking me. And then they said, okay, we're gonna go ahead and admit you. And then I moved to the, to the labor and delivery floor, had my daughter, and then moved to the next floor uh, where I was recovering. So just basing it on a room number is not gonna be enough because the person can move through and then be a real big problem if you send the wrong medicine to the wrong floor and to the wrong patient. So that's why that's not used as a primary way. Uh, continuing, uh, uh, talking about flow of orders, uh, the medicine would, uh, the orders arrive, whatever is prescribed by the prescriber, the orders arrive in the pharmacy around the clock, 365 days. In the hospital, the pharmacy is always operating. The central pharmacy is always operating because you never know when someone is going to need a medication. Now, there are various methods used to send orders. This includes the pneumatic tubing system. That's the example that I've given at the beginning of this, where uh, it's the same type of system that uh, the bank tellers use in the banking system, where it goes to the tube and instead of it going to a teller, it's actually going to a nursing floor. Uh, you have the CPOE, that stands for Computerized Physician Order Entry. This is where the information is entered into the data. And then you have uh, another way how the medication order can be sent uh, through a fax machine or even given to a staff member. Now, as the orders are entered, the labels are produced. So once something is entered into the system, then a label is produced and then the name also has alert stickers which are used when two patients with the same last name are on the same floor so that's going to be like a a highlight of something is different so that they make sure that they don't give the wrong patient the wrong thing now it's the technician that pulls the labels off of the printer and then fills the order and then once that order is filled it is then going to be finally checked by the pharmacist now labels are placed uh, in a small zipper baggie for delivery, and then it goes to the nursing floor. I'm going to um, stop right here, but this was just a mini example of what happens in a institutional pharmacy setting. Uh, we'll continue uh, the rest of this um, in the next in the next lecture.